Yeah, so uh, I guess kia ora koutou everybody. Um, my name is Hayley Praggett and I'm a Senior Advisor um, at Biosecurity New Zealand Ministry for Primary in Industries. Goodness, it gets longer every time I say it. Um, I've been at MPI for the last eight or so years and I've been really fortunate enough to um, just work entirely on honeybees. Um, I'm a beekeeper in my um, own time, so I really enjoy um, working on bees and working with bees and, and it's a real privilege to be able to work in the beekeeping industry and, and engage with beekeepers in New Zealand and engage with beekeepers a little bit further afar, like, like beekeepers such as yourself. Um, so today um, I'll talk about Baroa in New Zealand on its arrival and its impact. And following on from my talk, uh, my colleague Richard Hall, who was just up on the screen before, um, he's going to talk about um, management and, and, and other practices as a part two. Um, I guess before I really um, get dive into it, um, it's important to note that a lot of the information um, that we'll give today is from the New Zealand context. And so bearing in mind, we've had the mic for 24 years now. And so it's very much a long established pest there. It's part and parcel with beekeeping and it's business as usual for beekeepers. Um, because Barol is relatively new to Australian shores, um, it's really important that you're following um, relevant legislation for your state and for federal government and also all um, best practice recommended for Australia um, for the context. Um, but in saying this, hopefully you'll get a lot of useful stuff out of our talk today. And so um, I'm sure you're probably a bit varroa out, but I'll, I'll try and fly through the varroa 101 part. But to begin, uh, varroa mites are the most problematic pests of honeybees um, worldwide. They're a little external mite of bees. They're a oval shaped color. They're a dark reddish brown and about two millimeters across. They're almost like a sesame seed in, in size. Um, Varroa spread spread through beekeeper movements, um, the and, and also bee movements themselves. So bee behaviours such as you know swarming, robbing, drift. Um, Varroa is, is also spread a little bit further afield um, by beekeepers. So so you know um, packaged bees, nukes, moving whole hives, um, queen bees. Um, you can see in the picture here. I've included a picture of Varroa on the upper abdomen of a bee. Um, it's up towards the thorax there. It's actually pretty unusual to see a mite like this. Varroa mites are often missed by beekeepers because they spend most of their time um, stowed away in brood cells of the hive or they'll conceal themselves, wedge themselves um, underneath the plates of their um, abdomens. So, um, This infographic here shows a bee's life cycle. It also shows the mite's life cycle. So. Um, you know, the, the first picture here is the queen laying the egg and then the egg hatching from larvae to pupae and then emerging as a worker bee. Um, so um, you can see, um, you know, once an egg hatches and turns into a larva there, um, a nurse bee will come along and inadvertently um, transmit varroa mites. These mites are tucked up underneath the abdomen of the bee and so the mite will scurry down to the bottom of the cell and conceal itself underneath the larvae and so this mite you can see there's the little hopefully you can see there's the the number two there that that one mite that goes in the very first mite there she's referred to as the foundress mite and she kind of kicks off the generation of mites for everybody and so she'll go in and as soon as the cell's capped over she'll begin to lay her, uh, her own eggs and she'll lay you know five six seven eggs and the first egg that she'll lay will always be a male and then the remainder will all be female and a, the varroa eggs hatch really quickly and then they don't mess around, they get into mating and feeding on the bee. The, the, um, the male mite mates with his uh, sisters and his mum, charming, um, and then the, the mites um, party away underneath the cell feeding on this poor worker bee and then when this worker bee emerges from the hive um, it liberates all of these mites and these mites then go on to quickly jump in the neighbouring cells or they'll hitchhike and jump up underneath another bee that's passing and go off to start their own um, new, new cycles of mite. 
So um, bees that emerge um, from heavily varroa infestations are severely weakened and they um, also have a lot of viruses. So varroa feeds primarily on the body fat of bees. Um, so that's the equivalent to our, our liver. Um, this paper here showed the feeding side of mites and what they're feeding on. It was, um, before this paper, it was large, largely assumed that mites were feeding on a bee's hemolymph, but um, they had to play around with some really cool high-powered microscopes and they were able to show um, where the mites are feeding and how they're feeding and what they're feeding on. And um, I've just taken some of the cool photos from this paper. And so you can see here the first pic, you can see a mite that's concealed beneath the abdominal plates and then they zoom in again with a powerful microscope and you can see the mites really wedged up underneath between these abdo abdominal plates. And then the third picture, picture C down on the bottom, when they actually removed the mites, they were able to capture the imprint that this mite leaves on the bee from feeding on it. And then when they zoom right up again, um, you can see the, um, the puncture wound that the mite creates in the bee, and it's got a very distinctive shape of the mite's chelicera, or the mite's specialised mouth parts for sucking out the fatty bodies from, from the bee. And so um, not only does it weaken a bee, but um, these mites transmit a wide array of viruses, uh, well over 20. Um, the most damaging virus that, be, that, that they transmit is deformed wing virus. And in New Zealand, and for much of the rest of the world, we see distinct seasonality in mites, where their population levels peak in response to bee populations. So in the springtime, when bees are coming off the back of a winter, um, bee populations are beginning to ramp up in anticipation of the summer. And because there's increasing brood availability, we also start to see mites growing in population and quite quickly too. And so this graph shows that. It shows um, the bees are in orange and the mites are in blue. Um, it's really important for beekeepers to get on top of their mites in the spring. Um, so chemicals obviously aren't in the hive over the production period over summer, but most importantly, so your productivity isn't impacted over the summer. And so during the summer, a hive will often appear to keep up with Varroa as there's a large bee population or basically a large carrying capacity for Varroa. But it's important that beekeepers don't get caught out here and a lot of beekeepers do get caught out at this point in time. If mite levels are left to go unchecked for too long over the summer, it's a lot to ask of your Varroa treatments come autumn time to knock mite down back down to non-damaging levels, um, especially as they're heading towards winter. So if the autumn mite levels aren't addressed, um, as soon as the bee population levels begin to decline naturally, as they do, coming down from autumn, um, varroa will continue at its roaring pace. It, it will then you know, outrun the bees and um, the mites will cause irreversible damage and the colony will succumb to them over winter, if not sooner. So um, these really like super infested hives um, then cause what beekeepers refer to as mite bombs. So they go on to reinfest all of your remaining colonies. So you could have put a mite treatment in, but you could have timed it a little bit too late for one particular hive. And just as you're taking all your mite treatments out for all of your other hives, if you've got a mite bomb sitting around, those mites are all gonna go and um, invade all of your, your hives around it. But they, these mite bombs also end up in your neighbor's hives too. So the pictures on the screen show mites on a sticky board, a good, um, good lot of mites on a sticky board there. And the other picture is a colony in an advanced state of collapse. Um, this colony has parasitic mite syndrome, they call it, or it's also referred to as a mite bomb. So I guess that was a bit of a, a whirlwind tour on what the mite is, um, its life cycle and how it invades a brood cell and feeds on a bee and causes harm, um, and also the population dynamics when it's in a hive. But I guess now I'll talk more about its arrival to New Zealand. Um, all of the following info can be found um, in this report that's on the slide up here, and I've included the link there. Um, this report was put together by the um, New Zealand Office of the Auditor General. Um, it was completed actually not long after the response. 
Um, this was because of there were a lot of questions raised about the effectiveness of the surveillance program that was running at the time, but also because of the, the decision not to go down the eradication path. Um, so yeah, you can have a look at the report yourself and I encourage you to do so. It's pretty interesting reading. There's a lot of, of learning you can take from that. Um, but in saying this, um, I can really only provide content from within this report as the response was well beyond my time. Um, this was you know, coming up to 24 years now. Um, and it was actually before MPI as well. This was uh, MAF days, the Ministry for Primary Industry. So that was Ministry of Agriculture and Fishery, sorry. So that was MPI's predecessor. So Varroa was first discovered in New Zealand on the 11th of April in 2000 um, in an Auckland in an, an apiary in South Auckland. Um, it has since spread throughout much of the country today. It's in every corner, um, every pocket, um, with the exception being the Chatham Islands. Um, they're the last significant bee population free of Varroa in New Zealand. And that's um, simply because of their isolation from mainland New Zealand. It's unknown how the mite actually got to New Zealand. New Zealand has had and still has very prohibitive um, live bee and bee product imports into the country. For the last 50 years, you basically can't bring anything in. Um, it was suggested that Varroa could have come from a swarm off a con container ship because of this reason, or possibly from an illegal queen import, but you know, it's not clear how um, Varroa got into the country. So, so following the call, they did a bunch of delimiting surveys and the evidence actually suggested that the mite may have been present and gone undetected for five years before it was reported for the first time in April in 2000. So eradication was given a low chance of success. Um, I mentioned before, this was because of the delimiting surveys. The delimiting surveys that was carried out at the time was extensive. They lifted three and a half thousand beehives lids and they traced more than 770 beekeeper networks just in the first week alone. So they really made sure they turned over every stone that they possibly could to, to work out the extent of the infestation. But at the end of all this, um, MAF implemented a three-tier strategy which included um, immediate, interim and long-term management plans. This included control areas as the mites dispersed down the country to slow the spread down. Um, the movement of bees, beehives, beekeeping equipment and appliances were prohibited within the area or from surrounding areas as well. Um, it also included a lot of funding for things, um, things like lots of New Zealand specific research um, and also um, funding and, and work towards getting in place relevant legislation and, and best practice um, for stuff like um, protecting market access and the use of miticides. So this strategy allowed beekeepers to hopefully get ahead of the mite. So this paper here shows the establishment of the zones, um, the control zones that they set up and then the subsequent spread of the mite. Um, you can see it took some time to get to the South Island, but by 2008 there were established populations in the Tasman and Canterbury regions. Um, today, like I said before, it's widespread. It's in every corner of New Zealand, um, the Chatham Islands being the only significant bee, pop bee population that are free of the mites. This paper is another paper that was carried out and it shows a similar thing, but here they describe it as the, the Varroa Front. And this is what it looked like as the Varroa Front rolled down the country. Um, this paper, interestingly, also goes on to look at the shifting virus dynamics and virus profiles in New Zealand bees as the mite moved its way down the country. And um, that's something that Richard will talk more about in his talk later on. So as you can imagine, choosing to not eradicate was a controversial decision, but the response at the time considered the input from beekeepers, beekeeping groups and various other se sectors, but the technical advisory group determined it to be a very low probability of complete eradication. Uh, this was you know, because of the, the amount of time the mite had been in the country undetected, but there was also a lot of technical obstacles. And these technical obstacles included um, 
you know, the potential wider spread of the mite, the difficulty in detecting and treating new infestations of the mite. So for all is really hard to detect when it's in low numbers in a hive, and especially under a response scenario. So this was one of the key obstacles that came up. Um, th another obstacle was um, the challenge of destroying all feral colonies because uh, feral bee colonies act as reservoirs. And there are a lot of concerns raised about doing this from the public and also um, the environmental harm that feral baiting would cause to other animals and, and other insects. Um, and another um, further obstacle was um, just non-compliance from beekeepers was also flagged as a concern. So um, this de decision meant that New Zealand beekeepers had to learn to live with the mite and get ready for it as best that they could. So I mentioned there was a whole lot of funding for New Zealand-based research and, and here's something that, that still carries on today. So this book was was well, this research was commissioned at the time and this book was a uh, um, output from it um, and alongside this book a, a whole series of trainings took place to gear beekeepers up on on how to manage varroa. Um, this publication itself has been recently updated and is, is still going it's still available and it's still a, a valuable tool for beekeepers in New Zealand and and I, I, I encourage anybody everybody to have a look at it. It's got some really useful things in there. Um, the final few slides, I'll talk about the impact of varroa on beekeepers, and I'll talk about some of the work that continues to support beekeepers. So um, here's a figure here um, from the annual apiculture monitoring report um, that MPI produces. This figure shows registered beekeeping enterprises or registered beekeepers and the hive numbers in New Zealand and this goes from 2000 to 2003. Um, I've circled on this this um, graph here, um, 2000 that was the time of the North Island incursion in Auckland and 2004 that was the first time varroa was detected in the South Island. Um, you can see that there are a number of beekeepers who left the industry during the time, but overall bee numbers remained relatively flat. And then as, as we come forward to now, um, you can see that a lot of beekeepers have come back to the industry and bee numbers have, have, have risen greatly. Um, and this is largely because of the Manuka boom experienced in, the, in, in New Zealand here. Um, but more recently, we're starting to see both metrics now start to track downwards. And, and this is for actually a number of reasons, but one of these reasons is Varroa. And it's, the, it's because of the cost of controlling Varroa um, is, is, is a key reason that's cited. So the costs of hive management um, and also the time it takes um, needed for varroa control is, is, has, has greatly increased. Um, Pre-varroa, um, beekeeper to hive ratio was around 800 hives to one beekeeper, but now, um, since varroa, we see this ratio has come right down. It's halved, if not less. It's, it's down to one beekeeper to 400 hives. Um, this is because of all the intensive monitoring, treating and interventions required throughout the year. Um, there's also the added cost of varroa treatments themselves. And so before varroa, this was zero. And, and now beekeepers, and this is a conservative figure, beekeepers pay $55 per hive each year just to keep mites in check. Richard's going to talk more about what treatment options are available in the next talk. But I guess the take home here is that varroa is very costly. Um, and it's especially costly when you layer on the impact of, you know, the reduced productivity from the mite and, and overall, you know, the wider context, honey prices and general cost of living that we find today. So another impact of Varroa was the complete decimation of feral colonies. So New Zealand still has seasonal swarms and some which might manage to escape collection from a an enthusiastic beekeeper and they might set up a swarm uh, they might set up a feral colony somewhere but these feral colonies are very short-lived and that's because of varroa so varroa will um, quickly cause a colony to collapse within a year if that it's they're lucky to get to a year so 
all hives in New Zealand require um, intervention by a beekeeper in order to survive. They need varroa treatment multiple times per year, as well as constant monitoring. So because of the importance of bee health and keeping tabs on it, uh, MPI contracts Manaki Whenua Landcare Research to survey um, New Zealand beekeepers on the impacts of endemic pests such as varroa. Um, so this, this survey, this annual questionnaire is sent out to every registered beekeeper and it asks them about all of their overwintering losses and the possible reasons why beekeepers lose um, hives during this time. So we use these results to monitor and compare colony loss rates between New Zealand and more than 40 other different countries. So it's, it's really useful to know how we're tracking, but these results also drive a lot of targeted work to improve bee health in New Zealand. And, and Richard will, will talk about some of this work that's, that's taken place um, that, that's informed by the colony loss survey here. So the last survey just carried out, uh, three and a half thousand beekeepers completed the survey. So that's a pretty good response rate. That's about 43% of all New Zealand beekeepers took part in this. And it shows the trend of the overall loss rates since the start. So this has been going for, for nine years now. And so in 2015, it was you know down at 8.4%. We were losing 8.4% of the hives over winter. Um, it, it steadily climbed then to a peak in 2021, and that was to that was 13.6 percent of hives were lost over winter for various reasons. But um, in the last few years, we've started to see it come down, and, and last year it was 12.7 percent over winter. And beekeepers most commonly cite varroa as the key cause of colony death. This is in both autumn and in both winter. So these figures are from the overall 12.7% loss rate. So how much of this was because of varroa? So in autumn, we see that it is made up of 35.8% of this. And in winter, varroa is made up of 50.8% of this. So you can see that varroa surpasses all other endemic issues and diseases here. Um, AFB, any other pathogens that we have don't even get a mention because their um, beekeeper attributions were so small. The, the next um, category that comes close are queen problems, followed by natural disasters, starvation, and then wasps. Um, if we use these responses and extrapolate them out to the entire beekeeper and bee population, so, so beekeepers who didn't take part in the survey, um, it's estimated that New Zealand loses 6.4% of beehives to varroa over winter each year. So, you know, that's around 90,000 colonies lost to varroa in New Zealand per year. And when we ask beekeepers, why, why are they struggling with varroa? It's not a new it's not a new pest, it's been here for 24 years. Um, this is what beekeepers tell us as part of the survey. This is the key challenges um, when dealing with varroa. So um, fortunately, you can see there's a small percent there that do not treat at all. Um, so those are the blue lines, but, but, but luckily that's, that's really small. The remainder are for various reasons, including you know, not treating at the right time so that your varroa levels were too high going into winter. Um, or reinvasion from other hives or from their own hives, so so the the advent of these mite bombs. Um, they used ineffective products or ineffective dosage, or winter weather exacerbated varroa and made it worse. So each pie chart shows um, beekeeper classes from hobbyists to large commercials, commercials, and generally speaking, for hobbyists, they reckon um, that the key issue for them is treating too late. So they're just, you know, letting varroa go unchecked over the summer period a little too long. And then when they come to apply their miticides, it's just, it's a little too late. The, the bees are declining, varroa is still continuing. You're just asking too much of your varroa treatment. Um, for commercials, it's kind of a mixed bag, but it's a combination of ineffective products that they're using. Um, the timing again, so they're just applying the timing a little bit too late, and also reinvasion. So that could be reinvasion from their own hives. It could be reinvasion from um, neighbouring apiaries. Um, so the next talk will dive more deeply into these main factors ascribed um, because of varroa. Um, 
I guess that about wraps my talk up now. Um, I was, yeah, I'll hold off, I'll hold off any questions. I think it'll be better if we kind of um, answer the questions together. So I'll, I'll, I'll let Richard uh, kick things off. But it's been such a great opportunity to be able to talk to you, um, albeit online. Sorry we couldn't get over to you guys. My email is there, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions. But otherwise, um, Nyamahi Nui, thank you very much. And, and I'll stop sharing now, and I'll, 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 I'll now be a, a member of the audience for Richard's talk.